Um, so I hope that we all know that fMRI has a relatively poor temporal property. So uh, as most people know, uh, fMRI has a poor temporal resolution and has poor uh, temporal accuracy in the detected signal. Um, so in part, uh, for sure, this has to do with the vascular nature of the fMRI signal. So um, the bold signal is measured uh, as a vascular signal and part of this temporal inaccuracy is due to this vascular nature. However, um, what I'm going to try to convince you of here is that part of the uh, temporal inaccuracy is also due to particular uh, methodological decisions that we take uh, in the fMRI data analysis pathway. Um, and so improving the temporal accuracy uh, is important for uh, event-related fMRI, for studies of functional connectivity, and for studies that look at uh, the, the, the coupling between uh, neuronal activity and vascular responses. All these uh, three techniques are interested in the precise dynamics of this uh, fMRI signal. And so improving the temporal accuracy by which we can extract this uh, signal from the data would be relevant uh, to all these types of uh, different studies. So here I'm trying to convince you that, uh, uh, that there's a new method for doing this. Um, so basically this talk has two parts. Uh, first I'll try, I'll just talk a little bit about the standard way of uh, creating these whole brain volumes uh, and um, the standard way and the new way to do that. And then in the second part I'll do a little bit of a, uh, try to evaluate this new method uh, in the context of uh, simulated data and some real world data. Um, so a key part of fMRI data acquisition is that uh, the fMRI data is collected in terms of slices. So uh, at each point in time uh, uh, when an fMRI uh, experiment is going on, the machine is sampling just a little bit, a little tiny part of the brain. Um, and so when you're in a machine, it is sampling sequentially uh, or in some other form, uh, but it's sampling at each point in time just a little a little part of the brain. And so, uh, for example, if you have just a brain with just three slices, you would uh, first sample this part, then this part, then this part, and then the bottom part again. That's basically how fMRI data is acquired. Um, uh, this is just a different way to represent that. Um, on the, here you have time, you have the three slices, and you can see that at each point in time, you just have a little portion of the brain as your data. So in this raw format of your data, it's actually impossible to do whole brain analysis because at no point in time you have a whole brain available. So you need to do something. At the, the standard uh, and the standard solution uh, to do this, to be able to do whole brain analysis, is to basically shift these slices in time. Um, so the idea here is that just is to just relabel the time point at which these uh, samples were taken. This is not a really uh, large data transformation, but it is just a relabeling of the time point. So you would say that actually uh, vol uh, uh, slice number one is not acquired at time point zero, but it's actually acquired at time point one. And so what happens when you do that is that you, you create whole brain volumes. So you create uh, um, um, uh, brains in which all the slices are assumed to be acquired at uh, some point in time. And so I should say that this is the, this, this step uh, this is often confusing, but this is the step that happens basically when you convert your DICOMs to your NIFTIs. And this is the step D, this uh, panel D, is when you actually start your fMRI analysis. It has nothing to do with pre-processing. This is really the, the first thing that you do before you start your analysis. Um, and so uh, there are two major problems with this solution, and that is that these volumes that we have in this way, they contain uh, temporal distortions. So it is not true that, uh, that this slice here was acquired at time point one, and that this slice here was acquired at time point uh, one, because you have just relabeled them. And so it, it's temporally not accurate, this data. The second problem is that you lose temporal resolution, and that you actually sample data at time point zero and at time point two and at time point three. But unfortunately, in this representation of the data, that uh, temporal resolution is lost. Um, and um, this leads to a typical resolution in fMRI that is on the order of seconds. Um, so typical fMRI experiments that have a TR that is around 
between two and three seconds and that have uh, a number of 30, of 30 slices or more, you have a temporal resolution that is ar around uh, on the order of seconds. Um, so uh, what we have come up with is to uh, create whole brain volumes that are composed out of slices that are all acquired at the same point in time, but relative to a stimulus. So this method requires that in your fMRI experiment, you should present stimuli. And then you compose your volumes based on slices that were acquired at the same point in time relative to a stimulus. So to explain that a little bit, imagine here you have again this uh, fMRI data, but now you have three stimuli. So S1, S2, and S3 are sti three stimuli. And they're presented exactly in phase with the acquisition of these three slices. So this means that stimulus one is presented exactly when you are sampling the data from slice number one. So this means that uh, slice number one, that data is sampled exactly zero milliseconds after the presentation of the stimulus. So simultaneously with the presentation of this stimulus. And for stimulus number two, the second slice is sampled exactly zero milliseconds after the presentation of a stimulus. And likewise, here slice number three is sampled exactly zero milliseconds after the presentation of a stimulus. So what you then can do is combine these three stimuli, these three slices that were acquired for these three stimuli, and create a whole brain volume that is composed out of slices that were all acquired at exactly the same point in time relative to a stimulus. And actually, if you fill out the data uh, more, because you were presenting these st uh, stimuli in phase with the slices, you actually get a whole brain volume at each time point where you sample the data. So you get a much, you get more accurate data and at a, more, at a higher temporal resolution. Um, so this method solves these two aforementioned problems that uh, you, uh, uh, with this method, you don't no longer have these within volume temporal distortions. Volumes are composed out of slices that are all acquired at the same point in time, and you have a much higher temporal resolution. So with normal fMRI data, when you have about uh, 30 slices and the TR of two seconds, you can get uh, uh, up to a maximum temporal resolution about 70 milliseconds. Okay, so I hope that is clear. Um, that's basically the, 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 the theory part. Um, so this method really fundamentally differs from standard fMRI methods. It differs in how <laughs> volumes are created. It also differs in the way the statistical extraction of the signal works. So um, um, I don't have really time to go into this. Um, um, but um, I just want to say that uh, when you do normal fMRI analysis, you have a time series, you model an entire imaging run uh, in your model. In this case, we have uh, epochs, so we have a data that looks much more like EEG data, where you have a certain, a certain epoch that is fixated on the stimulus, and you, you uh, model each time point in this epoch separately. You can ask me about this more in detail if you want. Um, so here I just wanted to uh, evaluate this method. So, um, and we did this in the context of uh, simulated data. So the, of course the advantage of simulated data is that you know what the signal is that you want to detect and you can use um, um, uh, your method, this slice-based method that we have uh, developed and uh, compare it to how well it does against the standard method. So the standard method of extracting fMRI signal uh, is this uh, method called FIR or FEAR. Um, and um, mm, yeah, this is just uh, the way that uh, the standard ways of extracting bold uh, signals. So we are using that as our, uh, as our comparison. Um, the idea behind the simulation is to uh, create a large patch of fictitious neural tissue, uh, and we assume that uh, across this entire fictitious neural tissue, there is the same hemodynamic response. Um, so uh, we would expect that if fMRI were to sample this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, neural tissue, you would, exact, we, you would expect to see the exact same signal coming from each part of this uh, neural tissue, because the, the, the hemodynamic response in the signal is exactly the same everywhere. 
Okay, but so we are sampling this uh, in this particular simulation. We just use three slices. Uh, we have a TR of three seconds, and we just do uh, sequential sampling. So slice number one, slice number two, slice number three, to keep things simple. Um, so we, using this uh, idea, we generate basically an fMRI experiment. We use 60 stimuli as a slow event-related type experiment where you have long pauses between each uh, stimulus presentation to let the hemodynamic response go back to baseline. Um, each uh, stimulus generates exactly the same hemodynamic response uh, using this uh, double gamma HRF. And so again, each uh, sample, each slice samples exactly the same hemodynamic response function. Um, so the questions we had here was how well does each method, the slice-based method or the sphere <laughs> method, recover the ground truth signal? Um, and we can look at that by a simple correlation between our ground truth signal and our observed bold signal. Uh, we also looked at how well is the signal similar across the three slices. So each slice samples exactly the same hemodynamic response, and so you would expect to see the exact same signal across these three slices. Um, so this is uh, results from the sphere method. So you see the, in color, you see the results from the three slices. So this is the bold signal that is extracted uh, from this uh, a fictitious neural tissue um, with this uh, fMRI parameters that we uh, that we that we chose. Uh, the, so the red is the first slice, uh, green the second, blue is the third slice, and a dashed line is the ground truth signal. And so you can see that actually there's this temporal shift uh, of the of the of the signal across these three slices, uh, and this actually makes sense because, uh, as I said before. Uh, the standard method of volume creation relies on creating volumes in which you, in which you not exactly, uh, which the slices are not acquired at the same point in time. So you, so you get here these temporal distortions uh, within each volume, and that's what you recover here. That's what you see. Uh, by contrast, in the slice-based method, uh, here you see that actually the signal is captured extremely accurate. So there's a 99% accuracies uh, and by which the signal is uh, extracted. And that is because each volume here uh, is composed out of exa exactly uh, slice that slices that were acquired at exactly the same point in time relative to the stimulus. So you have no temporal distortions. Also, the, uh, the similarity of the signal across the three slices here is low and is much higher in the slice-based method. Uh, you can increase the temporal resolution of the data by increasing the number of slices. Uh, this is a common method um, and by jittering the stimulus. Uh, so you don't present the stimulus exactly at the, at the TR, but you jitter this a little bit. Uh, this is a common method to increase uh, temporal resolution. Um, again, uh, even with uh, 250 milliseconds, you can see that the slice-based method uh, retains about 99% accuracy compared to uh, the standard method where really the uh, performance goes down, and this is about 77% uh, correct. Um, so uh, in this uh, particular simulation, the slice-based method really more accurately extracts this uh, bold signal uh, with uh, near-perfect accuracy. Uh, it's also the accuracy across the slices is much higher. Um, if you look at uh, all the simulations that I did, so I did much more simulations than the one I just presented here, you see about a 25% uh, improvement. Uh, in addition, the variability that the, the signal is detected is much smaller, uh, so it's also a more precise method. Um, in terms of real-world data, um, we, did, uh, we took data from a picture naming task, so this is a very simple task where subjects uh, are in the scanner, they see a, a picture and they just have to say what it is. So, for example, in this case, you see a picture of a horse and you say horse. Uh, th so this is also an, a slow event-related design with long pauses in between uh, to really uh, let the bull signal come back. Um, the logic here was that uh, previous research has shown that in this task, in the picture naming task, there's a large portion of motor cortex that is active. Um, 
you're speaking, your mouth is moving, so uh, motor cortex is supposed to be uh, highly involved in this. Uh, and we looked at um, we looked at three slices that were uh, centered on motor cortex, assuming that each slice would see a similar hemodynamic response. Okay, so that was the, the key assumption, that we had three slices and that this whole patch of new motor cortex here would sh show a similar uh, hemodynamic response. Um, fMRI parameters, the only thing that is important here is that this is a really standard EPI protocol, so this is not, this method is applicable to very standard uh, run-of-the-mill EPI sequences. You don't require multiband or anything like that. Uh, we didn't do much pre-processing, uh, we didn't use any smoothing, we just extracted the signal from three slices in one single voxel, voxel with the highest signal intensity basically. Um, so what you can see here, uh, this is from a single subject. Um, this is the standard method. And you can see, I hope that you can see that the signal actually is, a, is more um, diverse across the three slices. And here you have a more coherent uh, version of that signal. So uh, assuming that uh, the same hemodynamic response underlies these three slices that are very close together here in motor cortex, uh, you would uh, expect a more similar volt signal across these three uh, extracted slices. Um, if you do that across the entire group of subjects, so uh, 30 participants, uh, there is a significant improvement in the inter-slice correlation uh, for the slice-based method compared to the standard method. Also, the slice-based method detects less peaks, so there's a different peak in one slice versus another peak. Uh, you would expect all slices to show the same peak if the same signal was underlying each uh, slice. Um, okay, so this method uh, allows uh, to extract the whole brain bold signal at, uh, with high accuracy and with high temporal resolution. So I think this is important for uh, these three methods, so event-related uh, fMRI, functional connectivity, and uh, neurovascular coupling. I think this has applications in uh, both and also in clinical neuroscience where uh, accurate detection of these bold signals uh, could be used as early biomarkers. Um, however, I should make, make a big uh, um, uh, beware uh, here. Um, uh, this is to say that we can now extract high temporal resolution bold signals, but we should not equate uh, the the ball signal with the time course of neural activity. These things are not the same. And there's a lot of studies that have looked at how well uh, uh, ball signals ma uh, map onto neural activity. And if you're going to use this method, you should really be aware of the limitations of using that. Um, so to conclude, this is a method that is really fundamentally different from a normal uh, method of analyzing fMRI data. The slices and by which you can, you can create whole brain volumes, that is really different. Uh, the way that statistical method uh, for extracting the signal works is really different. And I think uh, it improves the accuracy and the temporal precision of, uh, of fMRI. Thank you. Thank you, Niels. Uh, <coughs> for the punctuality of keeping us on track. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, questions for Niels? Maybe? I'm going to miss something that uh, doesn't imply that you have to have uh, some constraint on the experimental design. Uh, yes. Because uh, you need to have one slice, one of each of the slice of the volume, to be exactly at the same time after the experimental design. So first, let's say you have 40 slides. It means that you have to have a jittering of 40 jittering. Uh, and that means that the sampling of those slides is, I mean, not that many sampling. So that's one, that's one remark. Mm -hmm. The second remark is that it's, in the, sam the sampling thing is not uh, like a, you know, only sampling in time. As soon as the subject moves, uh, you have a 4D sampling problem, right? And that's, uh, that's, I haven't seen at all any of the, I mean, that's a major problem. Mm -hmm. that's, a, what, that's a massive problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, that may be completely, so I mean, the constraint on the experimental design and the movement seem to be two major aspects that uh, you're yeah. not uh, discussing I, very much. I, I, 
I think uh, a general comment on that is that there's no free lunch. I mean, if you want to improve the temporal resolution, you have to do something. I mean, it's the same machine, the same data, so something has to change. Uh, yes, you have to present more stimuli to do this. Uh, there's no way around that. Um, uh, with respect to motion, yeah, that's, I mean, this is a problem in, in fMRI. Um, and and this, that yeah, th this is something we should look, we, are, we need to look at. I mean, it's, it's uh, I mean, I have looked at many issues such as motion correction and, um, and uh, other types of pre-processing. Um, ideally, I would like to do that with a simulated data set so I know what's going on, uh, but uh, it, it influences the analysis for sure, yes. Do you do the slice repositioning, or how you call it, uh, before or after motion correction? Uh, I did both, uh, I, and it matters. Uh, that's a similar point that was made there. Uh, the, and with these picture naming data, if you, if you look at the signal uh, that is extracted uh, before motion correction, or after motion, motion correction, there's a difference in the, in the similarity of the signals. So um, yes, there's, it matters. For sure. And how do you know which one is better or? Yeah. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know. No, you, uh, that's why I think we should do uh, uh, simulated data sets where we control uh, the, the ground truth signal and we can uh, see, exactly see what is the influence of this. Yes. There was some work in the old data center. Maybe I can talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That seems to be it. Uh, thank you very much, Jules. Thank you.